Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I am so happy and grateful to have Samantha with us here today, who's more affectionately referred to as Sam Bear, hails from the Riviera of the West Coast, Santa Barbara, California. She's traveled the world, competed for Jimmy Kimmel's Funniest College Student in America, and was a semifinalist in the 2019 Ventura Harbor Comedy Festival. She delivers her take on millennial dating, sex, family, how she can have a master's degree, professional career, and three side hustles, and still not be able to afford sand on the beach. <laughs> the reliable quality that will make you feel she's your best friend keeping it 100. But please don't believe everything she says. She has also used comedy as a way to bring the community together for a cause producing sold out comedy and variety shows that raise money for organizations, including the Alzheimer's Association, Planned Parenthood, and the American Heart Association. She now has her own monthly room, Bear Cave Comedy in Santa Barbara, and has expanded to offer a creative writing program, Write It Down. Samantha, welcome, and thank you so very much for being here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was a, that was a fun little bio to read. <laughs> well, you know, when you are a writer and a comic, you try and make anything you send out fun. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun one. I, you know, real quick before we dive into this, you're talking about some of the organizations that you support, and you and I were talking beforehand. This is the recording date of this is June first, twenty twenty, and there is uh, just for historical reference, we have quite a bit going on around the world and here in the U.S. There is COVID nineteen coronavirus. There is a massive amounts of pre pre very very peaceful protesting, but there's also mm -hmm. some other not so peaceful pieces that are happening, and a lot of people are hurting, whether it's from that or from from financial loss from COVID. I mean, there's just a lot of things. So I I, I want to acknowledge that because you're offering to do some really creative and incredible donation based comedy performances this month and so we're going to make sure this is released beforehand but i wanted you just to take a minute to let everybody know what those are and then that way they can they can because it's virtual so anybody watching this anywhere in the world they'll be able to join in virtually and support some really great causes yes absolutely well we have our first uh, fundraiser show of the month will be on june 11th at 7 p.m pacific standard time out in california and that will be raising funds for the food bank of Santa Barbara, which has um, is now serving about 10 times the number of families and individuals. And that is a direct um, connection to the COVID-19 pandemic and just the incredible loss of, of jobs within our county. And um, food security, food security and food insecurity is a huge passion of mine uh, because we as a global society have more than enough food to feed everybody so we truly have no reason why any person should be hungry and um, i used to work with high-risk youth and children and the pressures and things that are asked of children they're very difficult to achieve in general but to achieve when you're hungry and you don't know when you're going to eat next and then to have those kind of pressures and 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 topics be discussed at home or be um, kind of a, a pressure at home, it just really can impact all dynamics. So I'm really excited to be able to support the food bank. And then on June 25th, I'll be having another show because June is Pride Month, so happy Pride. And that show will be benefiting the Pacific Pride Foundation in Santa Barbara. And as I believe, they serve the largest population between um, Los Angeles and San Francisco, which is pretty incredible considering how small Santa Barbara as a city is and still small how small the county is. And, you know, they've lost some of their major fundraising events because we just simply can't gather at the level that we did. And that show specifically, I'm having an all LGBTQ and ally lineup. Uh, we have surprise guests coming in. Uh, we have a TikTok star dropping in and I'm I'm really thrilled and excited. I'm also gonna be teaming up with businesses. They can be local to Santa Barbara County. They can be international. They can be just mm -hmm. people who want to find a way to team up to match all donations made. And you can pick which one you wanna join forces with or you can join both. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. And everyone who's been to Santa Barbara for Unlock Your Greatness or other events, be sure to check them out. You always want ways to get back. This is a great way to support local community or if you're watching locally listening locally mm -hmm. samantha we were talking 
you know, just a minute ago about how fun your, your bio is and you're saying the combination of a comic and a creative writer, you know, making everything fun. How do you, you know, I think, so for me, I guess I can't speak for everyone else as much as I would love to sometimes, but for me personally, I, I find that I will struggle tapping into my creativity. It, it mm -hmm. seems to be a skill set that in my perspective, it, it eludes me at times how does one begin to tap into their creativity? Because I would love for something that I wrote to be that fun <laughs> and then have the person turn around and say, Oh, well, it was a lot of fun to read it. <laughs> yeah. It's a, definitely a good feeling when yeah. someone just reading your bio, like kind of lights up. Uh, one of the things I, I like to tell people in terms of just starting is set a timer for five minutes. And before you start, do a power stretch, you know, arms up in the air and, do that for like 10 15 seconds but right when you're starting to feel like okay this is kind of weird do it for another three more seconds because that's that same feeling that you have when you're trying to be creative hmm. you're like oh this is feeling weird i don't think i want to do it anymore that's exactly when you need to keep doing it and five minutes is a really digestible amount of time people instagram scroll for five hours so five minutes focus on just getting information out on the page and I like to tell people write as if no one's ever going to read it that's mm -hmm. actually when you're more authentic and more vulnerable and read it back to yourself and then in two sentences kind of summarize what you wrote and usually within that summary that's where you're going to tap into your more creative piece and I mean that bio you read I that's been draft after draft after draft most of it did come very natural, but I did need to play with it. I wanted it to flow and make it seem, uh, you know, flow from one piece to another and just make it seem a bit more digestible. But ultimately, the content was all within the first flow writing. So the hot tip, power pose, five minute timer, and then reflect on what you wrote and a draft a, a two sentence summary on that. And that's really, I think, how you that two sentence summary that's going to spark what's inside you and you're going to be like i want to i want to explore this more mm -hmm. and then then you're good to go then you're golden <laughs> that it's an interesting i think the word is juxtaposition to the notion of writing as if no one will read it yet so many of us write because we want people to read it because we feel like we have something to say absolutely but then the fear to even start writing is what if somebody does read it and what if they don't like it? So it's a really interesting psychology play that you have to wrestle with. What, what do you feel like in the creative writing process? What do you feel is like the, is there, have you found with yourself, with people you've worked with, is there a, is there a monologue people have going through their head that is the resistance piece to begin writing? And how does that monologue change when you give yourself permission to write as if no one's going to read it. Right. Yeah. Uh, two of the biggest things that come up with people I've worked with is overthinking and perfectionism. A lot of people have a lot to say, but they don't want to start unless they know they're going to do it perfectly. And then they don't know where to start. There's, if it's not going to be right, I don't want to do it at all. And how do I know if I'm right? And the idea of creativity can be very daunting. Um, I akin it to like a buffet in, in your mind, you think this is going to be such a, well, it's such a great deal, $15.99 and I have all the choices I could ever want. You get there and it tends to be very overwhelming and you often tend to go for things that you're very comfortable with anyway. You didn't need the buffet because you just got pasta and garlic bread. <laughs> um, even though there's, you know, sushi and crab legs and all of these things. We think that if we have this limited options and all these choices, oh, that's what I want. I'm going to be better. But it tends to be more frightening. Mm -hmm. And that's what creativity is. That's why I find a lot of people are, how do I start? Because I can go anywhere. And the idea of being able to go anywhere, I think, can be very shocking to people. There's no structure. So what I do in my program and just in, in talking with people in general is I call them, let's, let's call them writing stretches. Let's call them writing mm -hmm. games. Language is so important. Even how we call what we're doing to, to bring about that creativity. 
I, and I learned some of this when I was in college. I had a psychology professor. He never gave us tests. He gave us quizzes. And the quizzes were 50 points. And everyone was a lot more calm. You weren't stressing out that you had a test. You had a quiz. Mm. How hard can a quiz be? It's a quiz. Uh, and obviously it was this, you know, it was weighted the same as a test, but you just didn't feel that same pressure. You were like, I can study for a quiz. I can pass a quiz. And he had some of the, you know, highest grades uh, for the majority of the students comparatively across the psychology department. I, I think one, he was just an excellent professor, but two, it is that framework behind the language that we use. So I like to say, okay, we're gonna do a quick little writing stretch. We're going to have, you know, a little game and uh, an activity that I do a lot with people to show them that you can finish something and to give them that kind of quick sense of finishing is I do a game called the A to Z and you write an entire story uh, using the, the next letter in the alphabet as the first letter of the word for the next sentence hmm. so like the first sentence of the story would start with a word that began with the letter a and then you'd write a sentence and your next sentence would start with a word that began with the letter b so it also is challenging because there are some letters that you're like i xerox how am i gonna work that <laughs> and that starts with the next um so it's fun it's challenging and you see that you can start and finish something and so that's, that's how I like to approach that. I like people to go through my program and feel light and have fun. And it's very, I meet with all of my students and clients and it's very fun. They're like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, we were about to get to week three and I was like, man, I really need to figure out who I'm writing to. And then you just had all of these activities about like who I'm going to write to and how to get in their mindset mm -hmm. and how to look at it from that perspective. I'm like, it, it's intentional but it's fun. <laughs> do you find, do you find Samantha that when you're working with folks like that, I, I'm really curious, do you find that there's already a writer inside of them? Because I feel like some people, they have this, or most people have this perception of, and I hear myself say this too, mm -hmm. I would write more, but I can't write, or I'm not a writer, or I'm not, mm -hmm. but then it sounds like like when you you give them this fr framework that almost makes it safe for them to write, and I love that distinction, exactly. quiz versus test, because I remember in college midterm and finals, and it was just you could feel the collective <laughs> breath leave the room, right? Yeah, even <laughs> and, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> and so it, it, it sounds like like when you give them this framework, it really almost gives them the safe, permissible space for them to access that magic, which is already inside. You just language it in a way and then provide the support and strategy to really maximize that. Yes, absolutely. And uh, mm. I, I, I talk about this in my course and just in my general life. I try very hard to lead a uh, uh, grateful start, grateful finish. And in all of um, the weeks learning of the program, I'm always starting off by saying, thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and invest in your writing because you're already a writer. So I make sure to really reinforce that because everyone, what you want to be, you already are. You mm -hmm. need to just own that. And what we hear becomes a reality. And I know that you know that, the same that it comes, it, I mean, it, we can take it back even to childhood, you know? There are, there are no bad kids, there are bad choices made. When you mm -hmm. tell a child over and over, you're a bad child, you're bad, you're wrong, the same way that this, uh, a different child was told, wow, you're brilliant, you're so creative, you're so smart, you can be anything, they internalize that. And they say, well, that's who I am versus this is a choice you made, let's talk about that choice. Why did you make that choice? So I really do like to just empower my clients, my friends, my students. I, I'm a huge champion of people and really saying, you know, you are this. Uh, my friends who are getting PhDs took it, uh, I think, a double-edged sword approach. I would say, okay, doctor, like to be, you know, you're going to be a doctor. And of course, they were very much in a stressful environment that is designed to kind of push people out. So they were like, I'm not a doctor yet. And they said, but you will be. And you'll know that I that I always knew you were. So um, every person that I said that to has also finished their PhD program. Am I going to take credit for it? No, but I'm just saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Where, where is the intersection for you, Samantha, between writing and almost kind of like vocally speaking, performing in comedy? Mm-hmm. Because I think it's such a fascinating intersection because sometimes I, I'm in the, I've been the opinion that they're almost, it's a natural synergy. Other times I think, wait, these are two completely radically different skill sets. Mm-hmm. And I find that I usually, especially when hearing interviews from authors who are just such brilliant writers but when I hear the interview it is painful to sit through the interview because it's like their ability to articulate anything has completely gone out the door and Mm -hmm. they are I I don't even know if they're really even making a lot of great points at that point versus then there's some that they seem like they have it very well and then I can imagine like taking that and doing it with comedy and live audience and entering that so where is that intersection for you with those pieces? Yeah, well, I definitely am a very practiced public speaker. Um, I Public speaking has never been a fear of mine, not in the slightest. I get those jitters, which I just think that's like excitement jitters because you're about to address. Mm-hmm. It's There's nothing natural about standing in front of a room of a thousand people, 500 people, and you're the only one talking. So pushing past that, um, I do, I think there is a mix of just inherent comfortability and expressed talent and also practice. Perhaps as authors might be leaning more towards, they are more comfortable in the written word and believe, oh, it's just a simple transition. Anything that you want to excel at does require energy and time and, and practice. So I would encourage you go back and maybe listen to another interview by some of those authors and hopefully they've had more practice and more time. Um, I think it's also being humble enough to receive feedback on how you're speaking on your Mm -hmm. presentation. Uh, For me, I was transitioning in, in terms of comedically from an improv style where you don't write anything down. It's by the seat of your pants. You're listening to your uh, team members. You're really playing off of, their energy, the energy of the crowd. So it's a lot of just quick thinking and quick reacting um, versus stand up. That is based, you're there alone and it is based on what you've written down. For me, I felt very comfortable weaving in what I wrote with quick observations within the audience, which is called riffing. A lot of comics struggle with that because there is that element of you don't know how the audience is going to react and it is off the cuff so you it's it's a kind of a balance of releasing control owning control and for me this also goes to confidence before my first show I remember being very nervous because yeah I was going to share something that I that I'd worked on I was going to Mm. say this is what I'm passionate about do you do you like it? Like, is it, do you like it? And I heard myself say that and I thought, that's not how I want to go in. I don't want to go in wondering like, oh, do you like it? So what I've started doing then and do still to this day is I know it's funny. Hmm. I just know, I know it in my heart. And, and that's the energy that I bring on. So it's that confidence of, I, I know what I'm about to do is the, going to be the, the best that I can put forward right now. Samantha, can you, and, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I want to just, can you describe that knowing, that knowing feeling? Because I think that there's a lot of people who have that knowing feeling mm-hmm. and they don't necessarily have the language or the skill set developed to recognize it and trust in it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such an, such a powerful piece to, pick out because I imagine there's a lot of creative types who are watching, listening to right now, but they, they, they've had that knowing, which is why they're drawn, but they've Mm -hmm. never been able to trust. So maybe do you mind just describing for real quick what that, what that knowing feeling, the knowing you feel in your heart really feels like. Yeah, absolutely. And I can see someone saying like, how would you know before you did this? Cause I did, I had that in my bones. I knew Mm. it was all, that everything I was going to say was going to hit and it was going to be great. And I had never done it in front of an audience, but I just, I knew. So one of the reasons what that feels like is 
I think just a centered, but also absolute energy. I mean, you just feel light, exuding light and physically light. And um, as I told you before, I, uh, I also, uh, I have a, a chronic pain condition and there have been times before a show where all day I've barely been incapacitated and have many times questioned, should I show up for a show? Uh, and I, as a producer, it happens, but I am very much not a fan of last minute cancellations. Uh, human focused, I get it, things come up. But comics have to ha seem to have a lot more come up than other people. <laughs> uh, so I also take, and especially as a female in this industry, I'm, I'm scrutinized a bit more and, and more mm -hmm. differently. So I take everything I can to never back out of a show. And um, every time I do a show, especially on a day that I've not been able to do anything else because I've literally been incapacitated, I'm just filled with energy. And it's, it's a very calming feeling. And it is, and it is trust, and there is a leap of faith. And I, I, I would be lying if I said there isn't maybe a a dollop of concern. I wouldn't call it doubt, but you're questioning and you're concerned. Like, is this the right feeling? And the second that you start, the second that you make that choice to trust what you're feeling, to trust that you are aligned, it it works out. It, so so let's see. To condense all of that into some power words, I would say it feels very calm, it feels very centered, and you feel very magnetic, electrified, energized. And when you say it back to yourself, whatever your statement is, so mine is, I know I'm funny, and I know yeah. what I've written is funny. Those are my kind of centering statements. I think once you find what that sentence is for you and you say it to yourself, you, there will be no part of you that questions its its truthiness, its authenticity. You'll hear yourself say it, and you'll go, "Yeah, yeah, I am." Hmm. So. <laughs> That's my soundbite, if you will. I love that. Have you have you always have you always recognized that sense of knowing, or was it something that you had to allow for yourself? <sighs> A little bit of both. I've, uh, again, we are uh, products of what we hear. I have always been told by strangers, friends, teachers, family, uh, you're so funny. You're so funny. You should be a stand up comic. So I've always heard that. So mm -hmm. I did internalize that and believe it. And I knew it. I would say things and people would laugh. It's kind of easy for me to figure that out. But it's different when you're doing it in like a social situation because your friends want you to be funny. Your, your family is supportive. Yeah, I had to really think and own, is this something that I'm earning? Like, am I really being able to produce these kind of emotions? Or is it just like polite feedback that my friends and family are giving me? You know, oh, you're funny. That's great. <laughs> um, so a little bit of both. I, it's different when you own it in a safe environment, which I would say is your friends and family. And then it is when you own it in a um, in an environment where there's a little to control. And so what I do is, you know, I know I can control what I say, how I say it, how I present myself, and and if I do all those things, it's, yeah, I just get happy thinking about it because I'm visualizing the audience. That's and incredible. I, yeah. What has having or creating? I'm not sure which the right word is, but what is what is it meant to you? and how you experience your life in creating this platform for yourself to be able to communicate with, with just really audiences mm -hmm. in these different ways, whether it's through writing, whether it's through comedy, how has that, how has that impacted your life? I feel like I'm able to take on a lot of different perspectives and <laughs> Oh my God, I'm sorry. Well, I know this is live, uh, fun fact, pandemic, I'm home and my mother just flung open the door and was <laughs> showering me with kisses. So that's, <laughs> that's how it's impacted me. I'm just gonna own like my situation. <laughs> that's awesome. 
So awesome. Uh, sorry. That's one of my favorite I answers I've ever heard. Say, that's my mom. That's my family I'm in. How do I know? Like these things, I feel so truly blessed that even as a, you know, as a grown up, my parents continued to be some of my biggest champions. So I will mm. ask you to repeat that because that completely threw me off, but it was the cutest thing and you're recording. And you just needed to know what was going on. Um, you were talking about how the platform, I'm back. Okay. So producing my own shows, that really came about because I was noticing being in the in this industry that many of the shows I was I was on or you know reaching out to bookers to be on had a lot of the same lineup, which happened to be primarily male, maybe only one female on the roster, and primarily Caucasian male. Hmm. And that to me was very limiting in terms of a perspective. And when I go to a comedy show, I want a variety of perspectives. I want to, and not in any way to denigrate male, white, Caucasian male comics, Caucasian female comics. I've had many on my shows. I am big fans of many, but to have an entire lineup, while they all may be talented in their own right, their perspective is going to be very similar. And that kind of gets old after a while. And I kept thinking it's, I want to see a show, I want to be a part of a show that I want to be on. And one of the things I take great pride in, and one of the reasons that I went, I'm going to take the leap and produce my own regular show, because I produced off shows for years, but I wanted to make the transition to produce regularly occurring shows. And it's, it's very much field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I mean, my lineups are always varied. I, for my first couple shows, I had a surprise drag queen come and perform in the middle of the show. A surprise for the audience. The comics all knew everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> how big of a surprise was this? <laughs> everyone? <laughs> well, for the audience. And that, one yeah. of the reasons I, I do that is because I do want to bring in different performers. I want to put people in, in an environment where they are exposed to things, maybe things that they're not used to or uncomfortable with, but in a safe space, in a fun way, in a way that says, like, we all experience this together. Um, yeah, so my lineup's, you know, we have different age, gender, experience, uh, race, and all of my shows are sold out. And with people at the door, I mean, I'm having to turn away 20, 30 people, and it's, wow. yeah, and I'll get emails from people, and they're saying, it's just me, like, just the one, please let me sit down, I, I want to be here, this is what I want, and that feeling and, and then I'm able to pay everybody is my other aspect of it. And I, and I know this from a producing standpoint. I've produced shows uh, beyond comedy for years. It is important to me. I, if you're a part of my show and it's a professional production, which I pride myself that my shows are, it's because I value you as a professional. Mm. And I want to compensate you as such. And that range may be different. And I think that's important to know. Like you can decide for yourself, do you believe you're being compensated enough? I believe I price out fairly to compensate based on a lineup, a feature and a headliner range. And so far I haven't heard any, anything to the contrary. And um, yeah, so Western for me, it's been able to, for me to bring people together, to spotlight other businesses, to bring, to give a stage to the lineups that I want to see more of. Samantha, we only have time for just a few more seconds. And I'm really curious since your mom came in showering you with kisses. <laughs> She's so cute. Who is your biggest fan? <laughs> and I want to reverse that also. Who is who are you the biggest fan of and why? Uh, my biggest fan. I think it could be a three-way tie between my mom, my dad, and my partner. I, 
I don't know which one of them is a bigger fan, but I do know with my partner, I feel really blessed because I could say tomorrow, you know what? I want to be an astronaut. That's what I want to do. I'm going to commit myself to do that. And he would say, you're going to be the best astronaut. Hmm. And um, my parents are very similar, but it's, it's different when you find that in someone who didn't, you know, create you or raise you. So I'd say it's a solid three-way tie. He might be like half a point ahead, but that's just because I picked him too. Um, <laughs> and in terms of who I have the biggest fan of, I really um, admire Mindy Kaling. So Mindy Kaling, if you are watching, <laughs> I've been a fan of yours for years. I'm, I'm shocked so many people don't know who she is and I can't believe that. She was a writer, a producer, and an actor on The Office. She's a comedian. She has written several books. She had the Mindy Project, her own show. She's been in movies like this woman is so empowering when I see her. She works hard and she talks about it. She says, you know, I'm up at 5 a.m. going to set, running lines. I'm building businesses. And she's very empowering, too, to see because also just how she looks. She's a woman of color. I'm a woman of color. But she also isn't a standard you know, U.S. version of beauty, idealically. To me, she is. I think she looks great. Better than great. Mindy, we can hang mm. out. We can share closet clothes. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's that kind of representation. I'm a huge fan of hers because I think that if we ever were to meet in a non-creepy vibe way, that she would be a supporter of what I'm doing because I see that through what she does. She's not just someone who talks about it. She's, she does it. And, uh, and I think she's hysterical and talented and yeah, I'm a big fan. Huge. Love that. <laughs> Everyone. It's time to rewatch, re-listen, take notes, condense your notes. Samantha gave us some wonderful guidelines, and this was really such an exploration to the creative journey about looking at and just trusting those things that we know in our heart. I love how she described that knowingness. It's one of the most beautiful descriptions I've ever heard of that, that feeling, that feeling we've all had of just the pure light moving through you and the, the notion that when that is connected, you can really move yourself out of chronic pain to just such an almost blissful place that it disappears while you're, while you're really engaged in that purpose. Learning to trust that knowing. And what I love about what Samantha shared is she not only talked about learning to trust with that knowing, but gave us some simple strategies to allow us to create a framework to engage in that trust most of us, they say that one of the biggest goals shared by humanity around the world, or at least here in the U.S., is to one day become a writer or a published author. And fewer than like 95% or maybe even more than that ever actually do that. What it's saying is we all have a story inside of us, but so few of us will ever write because we don't give ourselves the structure to write. And I love the simple structure, starting with a power stretch and giving yourself the idea that you can write without having it ever being seen by someone else. Distinguishing your writing, you know, sometimes we put so much pressure and very much learn, it sounds like too, the midterm, the final, the test, or is it just considered a quiz? You know, just considered a quiz because it is, it's lighter, it feels better, it's just kind of a little bit more fun to say than the test. You've all heard yeah. tests, it literally comes with its own dum dum dum. That's exactly. <laughs> right? It has its own soundtrack. And then the to come full circle to mom popping in and showering with kisses, it's a reminder of how important it is for all of us to find our own biggest fans in life. You know, some of us may not have, you know, sometimes we allow our circumstances that we are raised with or the ones we're present in to deter us from that. But there are people out there right now, maybe you know them, maybe you have yet to meet them. But there are people right now who are waiting in line, jumping up and down, pushing, shoving to get to the front, waiting to cheer for you, waiting to be your biggest fan, waiting to believe in you, waiting to support you. I think one's pointing at herself right now. And so don't allow the doubt or the naysayers to tell you anyways, trust in that feeling and allow it to guide you to the platform that you're meant to stand on, you're meant to, you're meant to rise from, and you're meant to share your creativity with the world. Samantha, this has been such an absolute blessing. Thank you so very much for being here with us today. We, I deeply appreciate you, and this has been such a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants more info on the shows or just to connect with me, simple, 
www.samanthabearman.com. Yeah, Bear, and then, like the animal, man. And like send, me, man. send me to the links for your shows. And that way I'll include them with everything. And then we'll make sure this is posted because I would love to attend at least one of them too. So virtual virtual comedy time. That'll be fun. It'll be something different. I haven't I haven't done that yet during these last couple months. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, everyone. We will see you next time on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.